raise funds for our grassroots campaign, to raise funds to buy the 4,000-year-old 4, 4, Egyptian royal scribe, the beautiful uh, wooden soldier from the Middle Kingdom that's on the outside, well, across from the cafe. And it's thanks to the Egyptian Art Council that we were able to raise the fund with over 100 donors um, coming to our rescue so that we could buy that beautiful world of art. But um, uh, the Ancient Art Council also helps to support exhibitions like that beautiful ancient luxury show that is across the hall. And I wish to, um, well, I hope you've all gone to see it. And if not, I know you'll want to see it after today's lecture. So it helps to support acquisitions, and it helps to support exhibitions, and it also brings world-class experts to share their knowledge and experience about the ancient world, and of course, brings a today's speaker to us as well. So if you're not a member, please uh, consider joining us and helping us with our mission. We would love to see you all at future programs. So um, I hope that you have seen the exhibition, uh, the glorious exhibition, Ancient Luxury on the Roman Silver Treasure for Murderville. And uh, it comes to us from the Cabinet Madai of the Bibliothèque Nationale de France in Paris, which uh, boasts one of the largest collections of luxuries in the world. And the rare and precious Roman hoard from Berterville uh, in Normandy, which consists of over 50 pounds of silver vessels and sculpture, uh, was at the Getty Villa along with the four large mesoria, or the large platters that are in the exhibition. Uh, they were all at the Getty Villa for four years where they were cleaned, meticulously cleaned, and conserved uh, and studied. And after the, these four years of work, um, these objects, plus other great works from the Bibliothèque Nationale, were um, first shown in an exhibition at the Getty Villa, and now they have come to us. And it is an amazing group of objects, and it is a great opportunity for us to be able to bring to San Francisco wonderful <laughs> treasures from the ancient world. So uh, if you have yet to see the exhibition, I know you'll want to savor the magnificent objects after today's talk. And now let me uh, introduce today's speaker, Dr. Jeffrey Spear knows these objects very well. He comes to us from the Getty Museum, where he is the Senior Curator of Antiquities. His education started with a BA in Classical Archaeology from Harvard College, where from September in 1973 to June of 1977, he had the extraordinary good fortune to serve as research assistant to Professor George Hoffman and his archaeological exploration of Sardis uh, in today's Turkey. Uh, an, an amazing site, a, a, a great scholar, and a wonderful man, I'm sure, to have worked for. Following his time at Harvard College, he obtained his DPhil at Merton College in Oxford with a dissertation on minor arts and regional styles in East Greek, 700 to 500 BC. And once again, he had the good fortune to work with one of the giants in the field, Professor Sir John Boardman. So before coming to the Getty, Dr. Spear was a university associate and adjunct professor in the Department of Classics at the University of Arizona. And among his other posts, from 1988 to 97, he was an honorary research fellow at the Institute of Archaeology at the University College London, and also a lecturer in Greek numismatics and Greek vase painting. He was elected fellow of the American Numismatic Society in New York 
in 2005. Well, Dr. Spears' numerous publications include such notable volumes as Ancient Gems and Finger Rings, the catalog of the collections at the J. Paul Getty Museum, a catalog of the Calust Gulbenkian collection of gems, late antique and early Christian gems, Byzantine, Byzantium and the West, jewelry in the first millennium, and most recently in 2013, late Byzantine rings, 1204 to 1453. Well, it's, it's obvious from his publications that Jeffrey Spirit likes pretty things. <laughs> His other ma major articles also focus primarily on gems, cameos, and on ancient coins. We are therefore happy that he has come to speak to us today while our ancient luxury exhibition is still on view, uh, to speak to us about luxury objects and political power from Hellenistic Greece to Imperial Rome. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Spear. Ephesus, where there was an early temple which he 
help build and further what way it dealt with. So he was dedicated to very impressive things to the Greek historian Herodotus tells us that a Delphi King Croesus dedicated a gold lion weighing 600 pounds and placed on the top of gold bricks, just to emphasize it, uh, gold in a silver mixing bowl, each of which could hold 5,000 gallons, gold in statues, and his queen's jewelry, among other things. And all of these objects, of course, don't survive. We're rather remarkably, the excavators at Delphi did find some impressive things. Uh, these are not in the exhibition, but I'll have to make a distinction here in one and I'll show a few things that are not here. This is in the Museum of Delphi. Uh, it was a life-size silver gilt bowl. It had been crushed in the excavations, but the, it is now on display. There is also over life-size ivory and gold statues of Artemis and Apollo. These are very likely gifts of King. I don't think anyone else had this sort of gold and ivory available. And such a dedication clearly was made not so much for religious reasons as uh, a display of Lydian power over the Greeks. The Greeks were then rather shocked by the sudden defeat of Lydia by the Persians in 547 BC. Persia was an even greater empire and wealthier, stretching from now from the borders of Greece south to Egypt, at this time they conquered Egypt, and they east as far as India. They went all the way to the Ganges River. The Persians were also more hostile to the Greeks than were the Lydians, and demanded that the Greeks submit to their rule. The wars between Greece and Persia between 500 and 479 BC, however, resulted in one of the great dramatic victories, the unexpected victory for the Greeks, where they were able to drive the Persians out of Greece. The Persians retreated into Asia Minor, but remained the dominant power in the region. And the Greek response to all of this is a bit complicated. They were apprehensive, of course, about the, the great power to the east. Many Greek cities in Asia Minor, present-day Turkey, were under the Persian rule, and there was always a fear of Greek hostilities. Uh, and at the same time, there's just amazement at the scale and the wealth of their adversary. But Greece, too, was becoming wealthier. Uh, during the Persian Wars, the Athenians, very luckily, struck an enormous vein of silver at their mines near Athens and Laurion, and very wisely used the money to build ships for their defense. Uh, but there's certainly a taste for luxury that's developing in Greece, too. I mean, there's reason to believe, although it doesn't survive much, they were starting to use silver plate and other luxurious things. They were surely influenced by the Persians because when they found, after their final victory at the Battle of Plataea, near Athens in Boeotia, in 479 BC, the Persians abandoned their camp, and the luxury objects discovered there by the Greeks made a deep and lasting impression. The historian Herodotus writes, they, spreading all over the camp, found their tents adorned with gold and silver, and couches gilded and silver plated, and golden bowls and cups, and other drinking vessels, and sacks they found on wagons, in which were seen cauldrons of gold and silver. They stripped from the dead and lay there their armlets and torques and golden daggers. And we don't have any of these from Greece, but we have them from other places in the Persian Empire. In the British Museum on the left, this giant gold. <coughs> Armband with griffins. The silver vessel is Persian. This is in the Gaming Museum. And there's quite a lot of this that is known. Jumping ahead a hundred years, Persia is still the great world power. The city states of Greece are in disarray, and the northern kingdom of Macedonia is rising in power. Philip II, king of Macedon, 359 to 336 BC subjugates all the Greeks and plans for the long-awaited war against Persia. The Greeks, especially the Macedonians, were wealthier now, having found gold in the north. Philip actually found so much gold in the northern part of Greece that it lowered the value of the gold in relation to silver, as we saw here about today. But evidence for the 
luxury is, is found in the famous tomb, if you recall, found in Macedonia, Vergina, thought to be Philip's tomb, and now in the museum there. Uh, this dates, if this identification is correct, it dates after his assassination in 336 BC. It included many treasures. His cremated remains wrapped in a gold embroidered purple robe and was placed in a solid gold box and left there. Another burial in the silver days crowned with a gold wreath. Love silver, love gold. Philip's son was Alexander the Great, who was to transform the world. And this is really the point in time, which marks the beginning of our story today in detail. Uh, after his father's death, Alexander immediately mobilized the Macedonian armies for the uh, anticipated attack on Persia. He was spectacularly successful, as you know, conquering the greatest empire in the world very quickly, marching through Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, diverting to Egypt and taking it basically without a fight, uh, then into the Persian heartland and all the way to India. He returned to Babylon, uh, the modern day Iraq, which was probably the greatest city of the time, planning to make that the new capital of the world, but he died there at the age of 32 in 323 BC. And his empire, his empire stretching from Greece to India, fragmented into a series of kingdoms ruled by his generals, carved out of the empire. So we have new kingdoms in Macedonia, Thrace, in northern Greece, in, at, at the city of Pergamon, in western Turkey, in Egypt, in Syria, and in Bactria, modern Afghanistan, mostly. And more than at any other time in history, it was the Hellenistic period, as we call this time, the time of Alexander and his successors until the rise of the Roman Empire, that embraced the wealth and luxury for political purposes. And this is the model followed by the Romans and the Byzantine emperors that succeeded them. So many of the objects here in view in the exhibition are not only beautiful objects in themselves, but they reflect these royal and imperial aspirations. Uh, the Hellenistic kingdoms of the third through the first centuries BC were new creations and new lands with new kings and aristocracies, and they were hugely wealthy, inheritors of the riches of the Persian Empire. A high priority of these new kings was the creation of royal imagery expressed in, in great monuments and in uh, statues, ostentatious public displays, coins, gems, and all manner of luxury objects. And this is also the time of the first, uh, I should note, the time of the first realistic portraits. Alexander the Great did not portray himself on his coins, but the successors did such as uh, Ptolemy the first, the first king of Egypt, the first Greek king of Egypt, which I'm going to go over here. And in fact, the Ptolemies were really the wealthiest and the most ostentatious and it's extravagant of all of these new Hellenistic kings. Uh, the newly created city of Alexandria, named after Alexander, Alexander the Great, uh, became really the greatest metropolis in the world, the creation of a mix of Greek and Egyptian and Persian with the aim of glorifying the new kingdom. Greek historians tell us remarkable stories of the temples you know, glorifying the king and queen and the cults associated with this. It was also a great time of artistic innovation. Um, I've mentioned the portraiture and other uh, statues. Uh, again, we've just concluded this remarkable show of life-size bronze statues of this period in new poses and in new with all sorts of different uh, intentions of royal and uh, artistic. Uh, we know that they were very interested in, in new types of silverware. Their silver elaborately decorated with mythological scenes. Um, the portraits not just in statues but also in native Egyptian materials. Uh, we have, they don't survive. We know that they were carved in exotic materials as a, a reference to 
uh, statue of Queen, uh, of the Egyptian Queen Arsinoe carved from Peridot, second precious stone, found on the island of Zebergad in the Red Sea, but a life-size statue of the Queen carved from Peridot, if you imagine that. Uh, we have a good number of objects in these beautiful materials, nothing quite as spectacular as that. Peridot seals are, in fact, known on a smaller scale, as are emeralds and garnets. We have, for example, this beautiful ring in Geneva, with a portrait of the late Ptolemy, probably Ptolemy the Ninth, they all take the same name, in the first century BC, set in a gold ring. And this one uh, recalls a story that was told by the Greek historian Plutarch, just to show you the purpose of these. They're not just beautiful objects. You didn't go out to the jeweler and buy a portrait of the king. It, it meant something. It was given to you. It gave you status. It gave you access. Uh, Plutarch tells us that Ptolemy the Ninth, this very king, in 87 BC, abandoned his alliance with Rome. There's the war going on against Mithridates of Pontus. And the Egyptians supported the Ptolemies. They supported Rome, but they didn't really want to get involved. So. He, he furnished the Roman politician general Lassalus, who was visiting him in Egypt with ships, to convoy him as far as Cyprus. The king embraced him, Sullus, according to Plutarch, declined to, and uh, graciously at parting, and offered him a costly emerald set in, set in gold. And at first, Lassalus declined to accept it, but when the king showed him that the engraving on it was a likeness of, of himself, of the king, he was afraid to reject it because he had to get to Cyprus. But it showed the function of these. The king would present you with a ring card, an emerald or a garment, or something like that. It's also at this time we see the first cameos, uh, these objects carved from agate, from banded agate, which we still use today. Uh, these are probably an innovation of the Ptolemies at this time. The finest surviving work, unfortunately, again, not in our exhibition, but we have other very beautiful things. The so-called Tazza Farnese, the cup that was once in the Farnese collection in Rome, and is now in the Archaeological Museum in Naples. It's a bowl carved entirely from agate. And both, it shows you both sides of the interior, a very elaborate allegorical uh, scene about Egypt, and the Medusa head on the exterior of the bowl. This is certainly a late Ptolemaic work. Um, there's a line with Cleopatra, who was the last of the Ptolemaic rulers. Uh, so he saw himself as the next king in Egypt, and he began to act in this manner as well. He was criticized by the Romans for this. Um, Plutarch notes again, this is the writer Plutarch, while he was seated on his tribunal and dispensing justice to tetrarchs and kings, he would receive love letters from Cleopatra in tablets of onyx or crystal and read them. Because these are just ostentatious displays. <laughs> the fashion for gems and cameos was widespread among other Hellenistic rulers as well, and the most of the Ptolemies. Uh, and then it came to Rome. As the Romans expanded their empire and defeated the Greeks, all of this was starting to be Rome. And the moralists, the, the moralizing traditional conservative Romans, really uh, complained about this. Pliny the Elder lamented with, that uh, this is a corrupting influence from the East, the luxurious East, specifically blaming the influx of silver plate and gems brought his booty to Rome. He said, uh, Livy wrote, the origin of foreign luxury in the city can be traced to the return of the Asiatic army, the Roman army coming back from their conquests. And Pliny famously said, it was conquered Asia which first sent luxury to Italy. Lucilius's triumph after the defeat of Mithridates of Pontus in 63 BC yielded gold and silver statues and vessels, gems and pearls. Mithridates was a collector of gems. And this is mentioned that his collection of engraved gems was brought to Rome. Uh, and dedicated on, on the capital line by Pompey. But Romans, too, began collecting and looking for, uh, for such material, and we can presume that the gem engravers came to Rome looking for new patrons, and we have this magnificent amethyst gem, it's 
quite small, but superbly engraved. And on the right is the 18th, the first publication in the 18th century showing it. It's a seated Achilles playing a lyre with the signature pointing him. Here's the signature here of the artist, Pamphilos. It's a period when artists were very famous. And uh, again, we know from ancient writers the names of these artists. They were much in demand. Um, and these were presumably very valuable objects. So the, the, these artists who had worked for the Hellenistic kings all flocked to Rome to look for new patrons. Julius Caesar was also said to be a collector, dedicated six boxes of rings in the Temple of Venus Genetrix in Rome. And Octavian, Caesar's heir, who had become Augustus, the first emperor in 27 BC, following the defeat of Antony and Cleopatra in 31 BC, uh, also adopted this tradition, even though he would portray himself as a conservative, traditional Roman, modest Roman. He borrowed a lot of these, uh, these royal Hellenistic signs of wealth and prestige to reinforce his own authority and also to help secure his dynastic aspirations. He was very concerned with who would succeed him. And gems, cameos, silverware, these were all prominent in this plan. They would be very important workshops in Rome and be presented to important people. Large cameos with uh, portraits or mythological scenes alluding to his accomplishments were produced. We don't know exactly how they were distributed. Again, we have an ancient writer Pliny telling us that Emperor Claudius, uh, 41 to 54 AD, uh, would present gold rings with his portrait, and that these were a symbol of special status to the people who wore them. So that's one indication of, of its use. The exhibition itself has quite a lot of material like this. Uh, these are coming from imperial workshops. They really are spectacular objects. For example, this is a small glass flask carved from glass, imitating cameo. So we call it cameo glass. The most famous of these pieces is the Portland vase in the British Museum. They're very rare objects and very likely derived from Hellenistic models as the three well, we think of the four seasons, some versions of three seasons on the Roman times. That's who that is around the body. Um, what else do we have? We have one of these large cameos, too large to be worn in a ring. It's this big. This is worn in a pendant or carry a presentation piece from the emperor to someone of importance. He's called Galba in the exhibition. I think he's more likely Claudius. Here he's shown a horseback hunting a female panther. 
And clearly it's the same uh, intention. It's an imperial commission made by the emperor as a gift. And it is, we also know this is related to other imperial propaganda, if you want to say it. The same image appears on some of the gold coins. Uh, here's Commodus uh, and the panther. This is an issue struck, I think it's around 183, 184 AD. As they say, too large for a ring, perhaps it was worn in a brooch or carried. More exotic gems come into fashion in the second and third centuries, notably emeralds and sapphires. And these two were very highly valued by collectors, by the wealthy. And there's evidence that these there was an imperial uh, prerogative for this sort of stone. There's a decree that's much later in the date of the fifth century saying only the emperor can allow the, the wearing of gold of uh, emerald and sapphire. We have a very beautiful example in the exhibition. A large gold ring with an enormous sapphire, a very big color. All the sapphires were coming from Sri Lanka. It's a long way. They weren't known to the Greeks at all. All of these sources came once the Romans, uh, after the time of Alexander, when the trade routes were opened up. Uh, but it's clearly highly valued. The, the sapphire is mounted in such a way that you can see the shape and you can see the color in this very architectural type of ring. And we start to see these at this time. Uh, I'm not sure if these are imperial gifts or what, but they're, they're certainly of great value when we're uh, only in, in an aristocratic fashion. Uh, another one in the exhibition from Paris, again, one of these architectural rings that was smaller. Sapphires and emeralds. And at the same time, we find this very elaborate gold work where it's open work to show the quality of the gems, but also the gold work itself. We have these two bracelets in, in open work patterns, in very elaborate floral patterns. These are also coming to fashion in the second and third centuries. The third century found Roman, the Roman Empire near constant state of civil war uh, with various short-lived emperors succeeding to the throne. These military rulers used the same luxury arts, the same tradition. Uh, you can see they tried to do the same thing. It was a way to establish their own legitimacy and to reinforce their authority. So the first thing the emperor does he strikes coins with his portraits and he gives them these things to his military officers to make sure everyone's loyal or to the aristocracy of Rome as well, people who would support him. Um, so an increasingly institutionalized, bureaucratic system of an imperial gift-giving developed. They call this uh, largitio, largesse, giving, gift-giving. And it was very... Uh, structure, who would get how much. This is all being very uh, organized. One of the most remarkable treasures attested in this practice was discovered in 1774 in Rennes, in Brittany, again far northwest France, on the borders of the empire. And this is in the exhibition. It's one of the most important groups, I think. There were nearly a uh, hundred gold coins found with this, although those are all preserved. Along with the gold chains you see at the bottom here, coins mounted as pendants, the three. A crossbow fibula, it's called. And I'll show a better picture of it. Get back to that. It's a, it's a pin for fastening a military club to the shoulder. And the fantastic gold bowl. It's uh, quite big, it's not huge, 25 centimeters, heavy though, nearly three pounds of gold, decorated with the scene of a drinking contest between the god of wine, Dionysus, and the hero Hercules, surrounded by uh, Dionysus' retinue of satyrs and other uh, people accompanying him. Spectacular work, all done by hand, all what they call chase, in the mold, not cast. All done from the front side. 
Also set around the rim were coins, 16 imperial gold coins in reeds, ranging in date from the uh, reign of Hadrian in the mid second century to Geta, who died in the year 211. So that should give us an indication of when it was made, probably shortly after 211. And I suspect this bowl also must have been a gift. This is an imperial gift, probably to a, well, most certainly to a high military official. This is uh, Donativa, a gift from the emperor. And it was kept carefully because if it was made in 211, the other things are later. The, the coins go as late as 275. Uh, so that gives us an indication of, of the time. The other objects in the treasure provide even more information about the date and the possible purposes of this and who owned it, although we can't be certain. There are three coins, as I mentioned, mounted in beautiful openwork gold pendants. They're all the same, they're all in mint condition, and they were all struck by the Emperor Posthumus. Uh, this sort of work is associated with imperial workshops and gifts. You can see the, the pattern of the gold work. Posthumus was a military officer, probably of Germanic origin, uh, who was imperial legate in Lower Germany on the border to defend against uh, barbarian invasions, and he was very successful. And this success, a, a very significant victory over German tribes in the year 260, led his troops to proclaim him emperor. And this is all what was going on all through the third century, one emperor after another, some would be deposed and appointed. He was relatively successful as a usurper. He reigned for uh, uh, not nearly nine years, which is a very long time in the third century before he was deposed and murdered. And he controlled most of Gaul, so France, uh, mostly in the Rhineland in Germany, as well as as far west as Britain and Spain. Uh, so as I say, he, he survived until 269. And so I think when you're looking at his coins in this condition, these were given to one of his military officers. And it's, we know it's also one of the officers that sur survived the purge and the murder of Posthumus because the coins from this treasure go a little bit later. They go to 275 uh, during the rule of the next emperor. It was Aurelian. So whoever this army officer was, he, he continued in the service. Aside from, uh, and also uh, the other point I wanted to make again, back to the fibula, these fibula pins, safety pins, are distinctively military. These are, were worn by officers. Um, the lower ranks would have them in bronze or silver. So aside from the fibula, valuable objects manufactured specifically for the military included rings, torques, were worn around the neck, belt buckles. These were all official kind of objects of status that were presented on ceremonial there's a letter preserved in, the, uh, in another Roman history uh, from the time of the Emperor Claudius II in the third century. And it's a list of the things they were sending to the officials, sent, being sent to the procurator of Syria, uh, a military post. Two red military tunics each year, two military cloaks, two silver gilt fibula, and one gold fibula with a bronze pin. One silver gilt belt, one ring, set with two gems weighing an ounce, an iron band weighing seven ounces, a one pound torque, one gilded helmet, two shields with gold inlay, and one cuirass to be returned. That was something I had to give back. But it shows you that very precise what people would get and what their status would be. Uh, by the beginning of the third century, uh, all soldiers were permitted to wear gold rings, which was a privilege previously reserved for the upper classes only. And the, the practice of presenting gold rings to the military is more clearly apparent in the fourth century. We have a number of these rings. This is not in the exhibition, uh, but we have similar things. Gold ring inscribed fidem. You can see the fidem Constantino. It's loyalty to Constantine. So this would be given to the officer. But a good number of these exist. And another symbol of military rank was the sword belt. Everyone 
wore swords and they were given special buckles and occasionally whole belts. In the exhibition, we have an, another very fine gold piece. This isn't the actual buckle, it's a, it's a tab from a belt. Uh, sometimes they have pieces hanging off it or the other end. Again, this very fine open work and engraved with symbols of this is this, a city goddess, probably Constantinople. Here. And uh, images of prosperity, Cupid's carrying grapes and uh, symbols of prosperity and, and produce. So, this again is a, a military offering or someone of high official at the time of Constantine the Great in the fourth century. And these buckles, this sort of thing, belt ornaments and buckles became more and more elaborate. Those became very important as we move on into the Roman Empire. Very popular with the barbarian kings, too. The Romans started to give all these objects to their Germanic allies, trying to again buy them off so they don't invade Rome, which only worked for a little while. Uh, but they do become very elaborate. They start in Rome and Constantinople, uh, where we get inlay. This is a a buckle in the Metropolitan Museum in New York. Um, solid gold with beautiful garlic inlay, which would be the fashion of the fifth and sixth centuries. I just want to mention a couple other uh, types of objects that were being given at this time, even though they're not in the exhibition. Uh, well, this one is actually one more interesting piece. Uh, this is another one of these large engraved gems, like the Commodus one, of similar size, but done in the 4th century. This is a, a personification of the city of Rome. Uh, and this is probably given out at the time of these very elaborate celebrations at the founding of Constantinople, on in Istanbul, the new capital for Constantine. There are a series of medallions and coins, gems, honoring both cities, and I suspect that's what that is. It's a very large gem presented on that occasion. Very beautifully engraved. The other class of object are ivories. Uh, this became very fashionable in the late 4th and 5th century. <coughs> we call these diptychs, two-part writing tablets hinged. The interior would be wax, and they would use these to write on. This is what they use for writing tablets. But the exterior would be carved very beautifully with typically portraits of the emperor or the council presiding over games. Uh, was the gift giving was not confined to the emperor and the imperial bureaucracy, but was also considered a duty of members of the senatorial class on becoming consul or assuming other high office. And such gifts. Uh, as well as the presenting of games in the amphitheater, this is all at their expense, uh, entail a very elaborate ceremonial occasion for these gifts to be given. And the usual gifts were ivory diptychs, as I show here. This is one with the name of the consul Nicius Petronius Probus in the year 406, uh, showing the emperor Honorius. This is now in the cathedral treasury in Aosta, in northern Italy. Uh, we have letters from this time recording how this was done. Um, the prominent senator Symmachus recorded that he presented his friends an ivory diptych in a silver bowl, uh, weighing two pounds, very specific, on the occasion of his sons holding the office of Questor and presenting games in 393, and again for his Praetorian games in the year 401. So, so we have a pretty good idea of what was going on, how these gifts were being given. Also, there's a tradition dating back to the time of the first Emperor Augustus, although not so common in those days, uh, becoming more common in the second and third century, of presenting medallions in gold and silver and bronze, bearing the portrait of the emperor, and images commemorating any number of celebratory occasions. Presentations were often made uh, on the new year, when the emperor assumed his various titles, 
receiving the office of consul or the tribunic in power and or renewing his public vows. These are very ceremonial occasions, the mark on the medallions. The sizes of the medallions, again, it's all very organized, very structured. It depends who you were giving it to. There are different multiples. So someone of importance would get a really big one, someone not as important would get a little one. Uh, inscriptions sometimes provide clues to who the recipient may have been, such as uh, their fourth century medallions intended as gifts to senators, knights, and military officers. And those who received gold medallions often chose to display them by setting them in gold mounts and wearing them as pendants or necklaces, or they were probably made and presented in this form, for example, this very elaborate frame. Again, the same sort of open work you saw in the other pendants, but on a bigger scale. Uh, this is a medallion of the Emperor Theodosius I, who ruled 379 to 395. Uh, this is in a private collection, set in a very fine openwork pendant mount. But you see, this is basically the same thing as we saw with the treasure from Wren, uh, the coins of Posthumus. Even larger ceremonial payments could be in the city, but the abbreviation for Serum, for Sermium, which is today in uh, it's the present day Sremska Mitrovica in northern Serbia on the Danubian border. A lot of this, what's going on here, are imperial mints following the military <coughs> uh, along the border of the Danube where the barbarian invaders are coming through. And in fact, I mentioned before how they also were trying to buy off these invaders, not just fight them. We have examples of Roman gold medallions here. You get a very large gold medallion of the Emperor Valens uh, at the end of the fourth century. And this sort of amount of the little loop that you stick on, not the beautiful frame. This is typical of the barbarian ones. These are the ones they would give to the Germanic tribes, who would become allies, allies of the Roman and not in vain. <laughs> so, this one, for example, is struck at Trier as a mint mark in Germany, one of the sites of the imperial mints. And diplomatic gifts uh, would be a kind of notable development at this time. I'm not going to show too many of these, but we have found burials in northern Italy, which are owned by important barbarian chieftains or aristocrats, and it does comprise jewelry made in Constantinople, fibula made in imperial workshop, along with uh, Gothic made objects. It's, it's an interesting situation. So as we've seen, by the beginning of the fourth century, imperial gift giving had acquired a, a considerable bureaucracy. Gold and silver medallions were produced at the cities of uh, some of these I've mentioned, including Antioch, Thessalonica, Aquileia, Trier, Sirmium. Uh, and these same workshops were charged with the production of, uh, of other objects, uh, gold and silver ingots, silver plate, uh, probably the ivories as well. There is an official call, he was given the title of Count, he was the Count of the Sacred Largesse, the Kobe Sacrae Largitionis, and his office was responsible for the uh, manufacture and distribution of this material. Surviving material, most notably inscribed silver vessels, provide evidence for, for this. They sometimes specify this is emperor. Like, for example, there's a, a, a silver plate commemorating the 20th anniversary of the reign of Emperor Galerius in 311, the 10th anniversary of the accession of Constans in 342, the 20th anniversary of the public vows of Constantius II in 357. There's a big silver plate with the Emperor Valentinian that just says, Largetio, this is a gift. Um, and this distribution of gold and silver plate continued into the early, what we might call the Byzantine period, of the 5th and 6th century. Uh, the gifts presented during the consular celebrations of Justin II on January 1st, 566, are described in detail by his court poet, Corippus. 
Each group of men would, according to rank, beginning with the senators, step forward and receive gold and silver coins and other objects. And he describes gold plates decorated with scenes honoring the deeds of the emperor. And many of these gifts, as I say, were, were destined for foreign dignity, dignitaries and the Gothic kings. And these have been found in, in the barbarian kingdoms as distantly dispersed as Anglo-Saxon burials in England, royal Frankish tombs in France and Belgium, Visigothic graves in Spain, Vandal burials in North Africa, Ostrogothic and Lombardic tombs in Italy, and Alemannic Gothic and other Eastern Gothic burials in Germany, Switzerland, Eastern Europe, and the Black Sea coast in South Russia and Ukraine. How the Zavits reached their burial site is seldom known. Some were, were certainly imperial gifts, uh, such as the gold garnet fibula buckles and jewelry of extraordinary quality in the tomb of the Frankish king Childeric, which was found in 1653 in Belgium. And we know that gifts from the Byzantine emperors were still being sent in the late 16th and 7th centuries, such as enormous gold medallions, I showed you some, these were even bigger, they were said to be uh, a pound each of gold sent by Emperor Tiberius II around 580 to the Frankish King Childeric. Visiting historians record numerous attempts to form alliances with foreign kingdoms, and they involve, again, gift giving, bringing some to Constantinople, giving them things, sending them back to the borders, fight as a buffer state against the Huns, the exhibition has several remarkable examples of official silver plate, which I'll conclude with. The large serving dishes, known as misoria, are the, are the most notable type of gift. So the beautiful silver plate showing Hercules wrestling the Nubian lion was found in the Massacarara area of western Tuscany. It's certainly a Byzantine workmanship coming from Constantinople in the 6th century. And just to point out, although the empire is now Christian, they still were very proud of the mythology, the, the pagan tradition, and to show their education and sophistication, we continue to use Greek myth on their silverware. The best example probably being a spectacular large silver plate. Uh, this is big. It's this big. It weighs nearly 23 pounds. And also, and this shows Achilles and the removal of his concubine Briseis. This is the beginning of the Iliad, but because he has to relinquish his concubine to Agamemnon, he won't fight. So this is book one of the Iliads. Whoever, whoever had this plate or was given this plate was expected to know <coughs> Greek uh, literature. But what's interesting about this is this was found in the, in the Rhone River near Avignon in 1656 and acquired for Louis XIV. Uh, the style is again Byzantine. I'm sure this is made in Constantinople. I would date it later than what we dated in the exhibition, <laughs> probably around 500 AD. What was it doing in the Rhone? We do not know. I don't think it would have been put there deliberately. But an enormous Byzantine plate in the heartland of the Merovingian kingdom suggests that it was a gift from the Byzantine emperor to the Frankish king in the manner of those gold medallions I mentioned that, that are recorded by the stories. Another large silver plate, oh, just to show you the tradition, it's basically the same scene. Achilles, this is on a fresco from Pompeii in the first century. So it's, this tradition was continued well into the seventh century. Another silver plate of importance, almost as, it was the same size, an enormous plate, 10 kilos, more than 20 pounds, wonderfully engraved with a lion in the center. And uh, again, we did a lot of analysis and we realized that at one point this was all real. Friendly looking line, very beautifully engraved. And this too was found in Merovingian territory at Le Passage in the Isere uh, Valley southeast of Lyon. And 
finally, I think just to illustrate what happens, the barbarian kingdoms now taken, taken over, but they also are very influenced by what's going on in Byzantium. This is a smaller silver plate, which will tell us a story around the central pattern of rays or a rosette, is engraved the Latin inscription, Gallimere Rex Fanalorum et Alamorum, Gallimere, King of the Vandals and Allies. Gallimere was the last of the Visigothic kings who ruled in Carthage in modern Tunisia uh, from 530 to 534 AD. And up until the time, the city, uh, he ruled until the time his, uh, the city was recovered by the Byzantines. And this plate was found with other Byzantine silver plates in Belluno, in northern Italy, uh, north of Venice. So with the king's name on it, this is following the Roman and Byzantine traditions, he too would give these gifts to his courtiers. And the pattern of being in Italy, that whole area was Gothic at the time, so it may have been people fleeing North Africa or allies, other Gothic kings. But they too adopted this tradition that goes all the way back to the Hellenistic kings. So I hope that will give you a slightly different perspective and guide to what you're seeing. Um, thank you very much. Well, I believe we have some time for questions, if there are any questions or comments. I see someone in the back. Yeah. Are they? Yeah. Um, silver and gold plate in two different ways. I presume that when you refer to gifts of plate, you're referring to plate as one would in the 18th century as, a, as a, an object of silver or gold. I was. The silver mines, if you said gold was found in northern Gr in Greece in great quantities, where would the silver come from? Yeah, well, it depends what period. Um, we get a lot of silver in, in northern Greece in the Balkans, from under Romania, uh, Spain. Uh, it, it, it's just the early period. The Greeks in, in the 5th century, 6th century BC had a little silver up in the north, but not much. But at the Roman Empire, they were able to get it from everywhere. Egypt is fabulously rich in gold and silver. Uh, else did they have silver? Spain, in Roman times, Spain was a big source of silver. And those were all mined by slaves or by the local? Pretty much, yes. yes. Um, in the exhibition, there's two large sculptures. Yes. Alexander, the portraits of Alexander has such a huge influence, the wavy hair, and 
fleshy face. It could be. But uh, the proportions are interesting. You're right. It's a big, it's a very large silver statue made in pieces. Uh, I think it's partly, there's no easy answer to that. I've been struck by that too. I think it's what you think of not the finest work. It's a provincial in every sense. This is the Roman province, it's all as far away as you can get. And often the proportions were not the sort of realistic classical style you get in Rome. On the other hand, it's very beautifully made. If you look inside that statue, it's, the technique is a little crude. You see all these funny joints, but on the outside, it's very skillfully done. I think it's probably an indication of a, of a local workshop pretty far from the capital. Another? Symbol of the emperor, not him personally. None of these emperors were worshipped as a god. Uh, 